Okay, folks, I'm hoping that the audio is a lot better on this one. Uh, please let me know in the comments if you think the audio is good enough or if there are things that you think I can work on, along with any suggestions you might have. Uh, I did do a little uh, playing around and tweaking, uh, found out where I could set my microphone gain and the such, and um, I think I've got it good, but it, it depends on what you hear, so please do let me know. Welcome to Let's Fix Alpha Core number one, second act, Third Reich. And you're going to have to wait until the end of the video to understand why I named my presentation that. Let's just go ahead and get into what I hope is the good news about Alpha Core number one. The good news is that despite its many quality issues, Alpha Core number one is standard comic book fare. If you came to Alpha Core number one, hoping for a comic book of the old style where it was a straight-up heroes versus villains and you weren't getting bogged down in all of the the, like the, SJ, the SJW stuff of the day, the political causes of the day, you weren't being preached to, you were just dealing with characters, fighting other characters, having relationship you know, conflicts and, and fighting and, and all that kind of action stuff then Alpha Core number one does fit that mold. So if, if that is what you are looking for, that is what you're going to get, even though there are quality issues with the book. Now the bad news is, on top of its many quality issues, Alpha Core number one is just standard comic book fare. This is not a mind blower. This is not groundbreaking material. This is not something that is going to leave you feeling like you, you know somebody just divided comic book time into a before and an after. This is just a run-of-the-mill comic book story. Uh, it may engross you. It may not. It may wow you some. It may at least entertain you. But it's not going to be one of those over the moon. Oh my gosh! You know this. This is we have truly entered the new age of comics kind of feel. So just be aware that this is a regular book at best, but it does have a lot of quality issues, and let's get into some of those quality issues now. Uh, oh, before we do that, let me give an asterisk and say, I just read, have read up through page 58, so I've still got about 38 plus pages to go in the book. Now, it could be that something along the way in those pages makes me change my opinion of Alpha Core and, and raises and elevates my opinion of it to say, yes, oh my gosh, I had no idea, and yes, it is groundbreaking and all that kind of stuff. I'm leaving the door open for that, but it's 60 pages in. I'm not really hopeful. But I do want to put that asterisk on there nonetheless. Let's look at Cape Continuity as the first of our quality issues. Now, Cape Continuity is something that was pretty important in the first act. After all, we had the uh, would-be bank robber and hostage taker putting some holes in Brian Solari's cape to the point where he even makes verbal note of it saying, and this cape wasn't free. Now those holes appear in the next couple of scenes with Brian Solari, but unfortunately when we transition over to the next scene, uh, even though we have no indication that he has since changed capes, uh, we don't see any holes anymore, which is a shame because Ingrid Valdez actually pokes fun at Brian Solari about the fact that he wears a cape. And I, I remember telling people that back when I was uh, critiquing Act 1, I said that Brian Solari really shouldn't notice the bullet holes just yet. Let's leave that for a time when somebody else can point it out to him and it can be a funny joke. And this is that perfect moment. We should have gotten rid of this particular little uh, bit of dialogue and left it to the point where Ingrid Valdez comments on his cape. And who insisted on a cape? I see yours got shot up again, by the way. What? Oh, damn it. And that would have been a nice, funny moment in the book. Moving on to the dialogue problems in the book. And there are plenty, and they are of a variety, let me tell you. So, first of all, we just have some clunky dialogue. And, and one thing I don't understand, who in the history of the world has ever shortened Brian to Bry? Is, is, is that actually a thing? Because I didn't think it was. I mean, I live in Texas. I've lived in Texas since I was eight years old. Shortening Brian to Bry is 
not really something we do down here. And especially because when we pronounce the name Brian in a Texas accent, it's Brian. It's it's practically one syllable as it is. It's it's more like the sh the, the name for shrimp, Brian, you know, B-R-I-N-E. You know, Brian Shrimp, you know, Brian somebody, you know, Brian Solari. Um, yeah, we don't do bry here. So I, I don't know where this is coming from. I mean, maybe maybe there was somebody that Chuck Dixon knew once upon a time who went by bry instead of Brian. I mean, it's entirely possible. I just have never heard of this. I mean, put it in the comments if you've actually heard of somebody whose name was uh, was shortened to bry from Brian. To me, it's like trying to shorten June to J-U-N when you're writing it on a check. So in this uh, first bubble of dialogue, he's saying, I was thinking, Bri, AirPod 1 or The Pod, not a sexy name for this craft. Well, those are two names you're offering up, and really, even the sexiest of the two is not really sexy, so you may as well just stick with one, and let's just rewrite this whole bot dialogue balloon as, I was thinking, Brian, AirPod 1 is not a sexy name for this craft. What about the airy? What's that mean? It means eagle's nest. Well, then call it that. Wait, call it what? Because he just told you two different things. He, call, he told you the airy, but then he also told you eagle nest. So did you mean the airy, call it the airy, or did you mean call it eagle nest? Just a little bit of clarity would help. Airy it is, then. Next, we have some dialogue bloat. In this case, we have Ingrid and Brian squaring off after a disagreement, and Ray steps in the middle saying, break it up, all right? You're on the same side. And Solari talks with this de-escalation language like, I know, let us both take a breather. We don't need that dialogue balloon at all. Let's just remove it. And by removing it, we can keep the tension existing between Ingrid and Brian and then have Ray do all the talking, trying to de-escalate things between the two and not very successfully. Break it up, all right? You're on the same side. Have an herbal tea, Ingrid. Brian, go punch something. Now, another dialogue problem that's really subtle here is the grouping of dialogue balloons thematically. Uh, and that occurs here. The problem occurs here in the second dialogue balloon where you've got both de-escalation language and escalation language in a scene where Galvan, the character here, is escalating. So you don't want to mix the two if you can avoid that. Moreover, if you look at this language here, you have a kind of a, a statement and a response that are in two separate panels. Well, why not just put them in the same panel, and that way you save the de-escalation language for the first panel, and then you have just escalation language in the second panel. And that way you're not getting the streams mixed. So it's going to look like this instead. It's for felony theft. No need for you to get involved, sir. Sir, I like that. I do. And, you know, that makes it seem like Galvin is actually contemplating the possibility of de-escalation. De but then, in the bottom panel, it's like, nah, I'm not going to do that. It's too late. Only Gloria ain't going nowhere today. Here's a dialogue problem that is based on uh, pronoun usage, they and them. Uh, and not in the gender sense, just in the basic sense of we don't know exactly who you're talking about. Now, whatever is said between us stays between us. Yeah. So what have you told them? Nothing. I gave up nothing. Only they told me that bomb wasn't for real. There's a them and there's a they. And these are two different entities. The them in the first panel are the police. So what have you told the police? Because this was who the, uh, the character here, Cecil, was just talking to before the lawyer, Ridley Vanessen, uh, interrupted them. So he's asking, what have you told the police? And then Cecil says, nothing. I gave up nothing. Only they told me that bomb wasn't for real. Now, the they in this case is not the police. The police, as well as him, now know that the bomb was for real. So the police are not going to tell him that the bomb wasn't for real. I mean, he's already seen the evidence that it was for real with his own eyes. Who are the they, then? Well, the they are Cecil's employers. They're the ones. But you need to make that clear. So how do we fix this? Well, there's nothing to fix in the prior panel because 
Like I said, he had just come from talking to the police, so when uh, Ridley asks him, what have you told them, it's only natural to assume he means, what have you told the police? But in this second panel, you have nothing. I gave up nothing. Only the people that hired me told me that bomb wasn't for real. And now it's clear who is the they versus the them. Some of these dialogue problems are just, you know, plain grammatical screw-ups. Like, for example, this balloon here. When law enforcement runs into an exit problem they can't handle, and that's where y'all come in, um, that's like just one giant when clause. There's no actual succeeding clause. And the reason being is that the word and is used here instead of a comma. It should be a comma. When law enforcement runs into an exit problem they can't handle, that's where y'all come in. So Brian Solari responds, So Braxwell and me fly an overlook and stopping problems before they escalate is a bad thing? And here comes the problem sentence, reassuring to the populace that they had air cover. That, that's not even a complete sentence. No, he needs to say something more like, it reassures the populace to know they have air cover. Here is a problem of dialogue sequencing, because what we have is the character of BBQ, Billy Bob Quinn. Uh, he is saying two different things in the first panel. But the problem is, is that this naturally comes first in the, in the reader's line of sight. We're looking at BBQ, we're looking at his eyes. Right next to his eyes is this dialogue balloon arrow. And so we wind up reading this before we read what is actually the first dialogue he says, followed by the response from Solari, and then this is his response to what Solari says. This should not be in the first panel. This should be in the second panel. What we got here? You wanted them super cops? You got what it takes to arrest me? I won't even work up a sweat. Sweat? You're going to burn! Now here we have a couple of different things. One is the lack of emphasis on certain words. You know, when you have words like alpha signal and exigent circumstances, those are... You know, distinct enough terms that they could use some emphasis on them just to basically hold them out and hold them as something significant. And moreover, you've got some bloat dialogue here, too. You've got just winging it then, sure. And that just kind of reflects what they've already said in the previous two dialogue balloons. You could, you could accomplish exactly what you need to accomplish just by having Ray let out a sigh. We didn't get an alpha signal on that call. Let's call it exigent circumstances, Ray. <sighs> and I'm going to use this to kick off a, a segment that I'm calling Wrong Emphasis. <laughs> because we're putting the wrong emphasis on certain things. We had uh, these words didn't get the right emphasis. And then there's other places where the emphasis is either not being placed on the correct words or being placed on words that don't need it. And the best example I can draw from the book is this scene between Galvan and uh, the cops trying to arrest him. So he says, uh, he, he's basically using uh, cops equals pigs joke language here. You know, it's the, it's the common joke trope that cops equals pigs, you know. And he's using terms like pigs, squealing, pork roast, bacon. But none of these terms are emphasized, even though it's clear he's trying to make a joke out of all of these. Remember, this is Chuck Dixon writing. This is from the era of Batman villains. You know, he, he knows how these uh, characters talk, and I don't understand why we don't see the emphasis where it belongs, which is on the joke words. Plus, you've got this term down in the lower right called, you're about to get galvanized. Well, galvanized this almost sounds proprietary. You may as well put emphasis on that to show that he's uh, he's basically pumping himself up there. And moreover, this guy's face looks so piggish. <laughs> you may as well have him squeal. So I would basically take all of this dialogue and, uh, and format it as such. So why don't you pigs take your squealing elsewhere? Uh -huh. Better yet, stay for a pork roast. Nothing better than the smell of bacon. You're about to get galvanized. Another problem that we have is one of late naming. And that is where we don't 
completely go without a character's name, but he's not named at the point that he should be. For example, this character, Ridley Vanessen, his name will come up later in the book, but it should come up earlier because we have Solari and Ingrid Valdez watching this guy on TV, and Solari asks, who's this guy? And Ingrid Valdez says, professional civil, professional civil contrarian. Okay, well, she should have the information. I mean, she is the investigator of the group, okay? She's the one who wanted to make detective. She will have the information that Solari actually needs. So she would uh, elaborate on this as to say, Ridley Vanessen, defense lawyer and professional civil contrarian. Another character who is named too lately is Galvin. He's actually named only at the end of the battle by his girlfriend who calls out his name saying, Galvin, what have you done to Galvin? But you, we really need to get his name at the beginning so that we have a name to tag onto the person that we are going to see these cops fighting. And we have the opportunity for that here. Uh, when the arresting officer says, serving a warrant at Lindo Gardens in Gun Hill. You've established the presence of an except on the scene? Affirmative, except Jamie Galvin James reported inside. Now, I don't know that his name is actually J Jamie. I mean, whatever his actual first name is, I can't believe it's Galvin. But uh, in any case, this is the place where we would learn Galvin's name. And that way, when Galvin makes his appearance, we have a name to attach to him. I mean, remember, we had the name for, uh, what's his name, Shadron, even though nobody ever knew Shadron's name. <laughs> in ISOM number two, and all of a sudden we were just given this big name tag saying Shadron out of freaking nowhere. So, yeah, I mean, we should have a way to know that this is Galvin we're dealing with. Here's another late-named character. This is Detective Callie Briggs, and we do get her first name, Callie, but we don't get her rank and we don't get her last name in this scene. We should, and uh, there's an easy place to put it. Where's a mope like you learn to make bombs? Now, Detective Briggs... You saying I'm too dumb to make my own bomb? This is a section I call shift changes, and the reason I call it that is because the cops change, as if there was a shift change that went on. So you've got Callie, Callie Briggs, and uh, Davies, who is the cop on the right, going to brace the lawyer Ridley Vanessen. But then later in the book, when Callie actually confronts Ridley Vanessen, it's a black cop named Johnson. A Detective Johnson who is actually there. So what happened to Davies? You know, was there a shift change? Did, did he have to go pick up his kid at the elementary school? I mean, what, what happened to Davies? And moreover, if you're talking about Detective Briggs and Johnson, those are two detectives. That's not one detective. So Detectives Briggs and Johnson, robbery and major crimes. Moreover, you could maybe you could tell, but there was a definite change of inking style. And that has to do with the fact that this book has five inkers on it. And you have to believe that at some point that's going to become noticeable. And sure enough, when you look at this scene and you see the, the style of inking here, I mean, this is markedly different from the rest of the book. It's not bad. I mean, it's, it's basically still coming through and getting the story across. But wow, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a marked change from everything that we've seen before. Now... Here is a whole section that I'm going to call bad choices, because this is bad choices on the part of the artist, the writer, the colorist, the letterer. These are all choices that should not have been made. For example, on the bad art choices, we have a problem here from, on account of the art, by, uh, on account of dialogue sequencing. Uh, we've got the, the dialogue in the upper left. Now remember, whenever you are dealing with a, a normal reader of comic books, that reader's eyes have been trained to go in a certain direction. And if you are going to violate protocol and have the reader's eyes go in some other direction, you need to make it clear how. So in this case, the reader's eyes naturally would default to this sequence. It's going to go from left to right, and then it's going to go shift downward. But that's not what needs to happen here. In fact, you need to go from the top left to the bottom left and then over to the right. So because we have Galvin's face shoved so close and because we have this kind of slanting of panels going on 
And because the dialogue for Galvin is on the same level as the dialogue in the first thing, plus it's, it's like they're asking the same questions. If you're not understanding what the context is, does your evidence fall within the restrictions of the Fawcett Act? And then the, Galvin's asking, you got papers on me, officers? It's almost as if they're asking the same question, even if that, even though that's really two different questions. But the reader's not going to know that right up front. The reader's got to absorb the context first and understand you know, exactly what is going on. So the reader's eyes are naturally going to go left to right and then back down to left, and that's not the way that it's supposed to go. It should be going left, down and left, and then to the right. But the art throws us in the wrong direction. And the same thing happens here as well. You've got a scene between Galvan and Ingrid Valdez in which he is struggling to reach the electrical outlet so that he can repower himself, and then he gets caught up in the whip of uh, Ingrid Valdez, and then you see his tongue, which he has bitten before, and blood flying from his tongue, and then you see this bit of dialogue saying, I bit my tongue again. Now that immediately makes you think that this is the sequence you're supposed to go, but it's not. In fact, it's exactly the same as the other page. You're supposed to go left, down and left, and then to the right. That's the proper sequence of panels. And why is it that we have it in both of these cases? Well, it's because Joe Bennett chose to do this stupid chock-a-block means of paneling, where all these panels are just lying one over on another as if, as if Galvin were Count Vertigo or something and were supposed to be disoriented by the fact that he shoots electricity. That's not really how electricity works. I mean, I understand he's trying to portray, you know, Galvin as a kind of chaotic character, and so the scenes in which he puts Galvin are breaking the rules and conventions. But the, fa but the fact is, is that breaking the rules and conventions in this case also breaks the natural story flow, and you have to be concerned with story overall. We don't need this fancy panel layout crap. We just need to understand what it is that's going on. If you can't make Galvin seem cool within normal square panels, well, that's a testimony to your poor artwork. But you can do it. I know you can. Here's another example of bad art choice. Why do we have Brian Solari's elbow digging into <laughs> Ingrid Valdez's virtual kidney here? I mean, this is just, I, I hate seeing stuff like this when you don't need to see it. I mean, we don't have elbow fetishes here in the United States. Maybe they do down in Brazil. But we could do just fine without seeing Brian Solari's elbow there. You know, let, let Ingrid have her space. Let her have her personal space in that panel. In fact, why the hell do we have layered panels to begin with? We don't need to lay panels down as if they're a deck of playing cards that you're, lie, you're playing out like solitaire. You know, look at this. This works just as well. It's just a standard page and panel orientation. And it conveys all the same information without confusing the reader one bit. So just leave things alone as far as format goes, unless it's absolutely necessary. You can just do the same thing that comic book artists have done for years, and you'll still be a good artist. Now we've got to deal with some bad choices in writing. And I understand I'm going up against Chuck Dixon here, a very, very experienced artist, and it turns out that means nothing at all because we're already falling into some traps like, number one, involving a character in dialogue who really doesn't need to get involved. This is Sandy, and Sandy, for some reason, is voicing her opinion, which basically just matches Ingrid's opinion. And since Brian and Ingrid are the main characters here, and they're the ones who are going to be in conflict, Sandy's not even going to appear for the next, like, 50 pages or so, so why do we even have her talk at all? Just take all of her dialogue and assign it to Ingrid, and everything works out just fine. Moreover, you have the conflict strictly between Ingrid and Brian, and that's where it should be. Sandy should not be getting into the mix of this. She's just the second, or she's just the, the, what do you call it? <coughs> she's just customer service. Another bad choice in writing is not explaining what grand theft is, because when you see Gloria, this is Galvin's girlfriend, getting arrested for grand theft, she complains for shoplifting the dollar store, and it almost makes you think, like, oh my god, you know, they actually they actually served her a warrant for 
for just shoplifting a couple of bucks or something? Because not many people know who a, what Grand Theft is. If you don't know what Grand Theft is, uh, then you're wondering, why are they pestering her with that? Is Texas some kind of fascist state where even the smallest crimes are like Grand Theft? Well, it turns out that even today in the state of Texas, if you steal anything over $500, that's Grand Theft. She stole over $500 worth of stuff from the dollar store. That's a crap load of stuff. You know, I mean, I ain't been to the dollar store recently, but, you know, last I checked, the things there cost about a dollar, which means she, she shoplifted about 500 items from them. Now, it may not be exactly 500 items. I know the dollar store, on account of inflation and all that, had to raise their prices some. But still, we're talking about hundreds of items that she's stolen. She is a criminal. She is a thief. And so the cop ought to inform her of what the limit is, should inform the readers of what the limit is, so that the reader doesn't get the mistaken impression that, uh, that for some reason Texas is coming down way too hard on, on uh, dollar store thieves. Now, in this segment, Chuck Dixon has uh, basically... He's got uh, Solari down and out on account of not being able to withstand all the heat that uh, that Billy Bob was putting out. And uh, instead of Solari getting up and saving the day, the bank manager actually comes and saves the day. This is the bank president. No superpowers to speak of. All he does is lock Billy Bob in the vault. And so Solari just comes in walking on, uh, you know, unsteady legs afterwards. Uh, where the bank president's already saved the day. So I don't exactly know what the point of this scene is other than to make Brian Solari look weak and stupid because all he did was go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Billy Bob. He couldn't stand the heat. He got beaten. And then it took this spindly bank manager to, uh, to save the day. I'm like, okay, are you trying to make Solari look like a clown? Because he does now. I mean, this, this doesn't look like heroism much at all, except heroism on the bank president's part. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what the, mo the motivation here is, and maybe we'll get to that in the third act, but I'm just looking at this thinking that if Solari had been the one to think, oh, okay, I need to lock him in the vault, and that way the air will drain out, and that way he'll, he'll, uh, his fire will put himself to sleep, then that would have at least made Solari look smart, which maybe that's cross-purposes to what his character is. Maybe Solari's not a smart guy, but okay. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not used to, uh, to, to, to people or writers trying to pump up their heroes by making them look dumb. But the other thing, too, is that it would have been a nice contrast because Solari is supposed to be one of these guys who's got a good moral compass, and he would have known that locking the bad guy inside the vault with all the money would have been better than letting the bad guy leave with the money just, you know, so that he doesn't accidentally burn up the money or something like that. If the bank president had been the one concerned about the money, and then Solari would be like, you know, yeah, but he's inside with the lack of oxygen, then, uh, then it would have been, it would have shown again how Solari's moral priorities are better than the, my, the moral priorities of those around him, which is something that I believe in the dialogue of ISOM number two was something that we were supposed to have communicated to us. There was a, there's a line where Ingrid Valdez some, says something about the, the fact that, uh, well, she's not, she must not be an evil person or else uh, you would have put her down or something like that, talking about Yaira. And so she's like appealing to his moral sense in that case. So anyway, I'm just looking at this saying, well, if you wanted to make Brian Solari look weak and stupid, you accomplished your point. I just don't know what the point was. Now, in this case, uh, we have a charred piece of paper discovered near the corpse of the uh, of Cecil, the former uh, bomb taker or bomb or bomb carrier and hostage taker, and this charred piece of paper turns out to be part of the visitor's sign-in. Now, I was actually going to give some crap to Chuck Dixon on this. Like, what is the visitor's sign-in sheet doing in the cell? I actually thought of a way it might get there. So um, I'm not going to uh, dwell on that. What I am going to dwell on is the fact that when Ingrid sees the lawyer's name, Vanessa, she doesn't immediately recognize it. 
I mean, Solari recognizes it, but Ingrid, who's supposed to be the detective of the bunch, doesn't recognize it. A lawyer named Vanessa, like, you, like she'd never heard that name before. Even Solari remembers the name on the next page. I don't know what the heck is going on with some of this dialogue, I tell you. Now, here's a, here's a little thing about uh, using abbreviations too soon. Uh, this is our first, or the Ripaverse's, first crime comic. So, uh, the readers are not likely to know offhand that K.A.'s means known associates. You really need to spell it out, at least in your first issue. You don't necessarily have to do it in issues going forward. You can assume that, you know, you have some continuous readers. But, uh, but K.A.'s, to, to just throw that in the reader's face right, right up front, I, I don't know about that. One of the just absolute worst choices, uh, and, and I don't know... I don't know if this was something that was like revised in editorial or something, or if this was uh, uh, written in there by Chuck Dixon from the start, but was putting the fights between Galvin and Ingrid Valdez and Solari and BBQ as concurrent rather than sequential. One of these should have come after the other. These, this should not have been a mixture of fights as if it were concurrent. And the main, the main reason for that is that it's just confusing. You see, you have this back and forth that goes on. At the at the end of this page, you see uh, Ingrid hit uh, hit Galvin with her whip, and you want to know what happens to Galvin, but we get shoved over into Solari's fight. And then when Solari is down, we get shoved back over into the fight with Galvin, and now we see what happens, but we have to actually kind of turn back a page to figure out, okay, wait, wait a minute, what happened previously? Oh, okay, she hit him with the whip, and now he's flying out the window. And then at the end of this page, now we're back in the vault again. So it's like, ah, stop jerking us back and forth. But moreover, Alpha Core is a comic that's probably only going to come out like once a year. And if it comes out once a year, that means you need to you need to pack in as many distinct scenes as you possibly can to make sure that the reader feels like he's getting his the bang for his buck. And if you have two fights sequentially where you have a beginning, middle, and end of the fight, beginning, middle, and end of the fight, that plays out as if two distinct things have happened, as opposed to a mixture where you have one character in one location gets into a fight, one character in the other location gets into a fight, and it's all one mix and mishmash, and then it all ends, and then, and then it all feels like one jumbled scene, as opposed to two sequential scenes that make the reader feel like he's gotten two things for the price of one. So it was, it was just a big mistake to have these be concurrently played out. This particular scene is a bad choice, contains some bad choices in terms of art and writing, because if you look at the cops who are being thrown around by Galvin's electricity, if you look at Braxwell coming in, he looks just like one of the cops getting thrown around. So when I saw this, it was like it, I had to take a couple seconds and realize, oh, wait. That's not a cop getting thrown back by electricity. That's actually Braxwell diving in. So there might be a way that you could show Braxwell coming in in a way that's not making him look like he's being flung backwards instead. But better yet, why not remove him from the scene altogether? Because this having him in the scene spoils the surprise of how the cops are going to be rescued from Galvan. You know, in, in uh, if you take him out of that panel, of this panel that uh, I just took him out of, and then you turn the page and it's like Braxwell to the rescue, that is the surprise and relief that the reader needs for that nice emotional kick. And moreover, now that Braxwell's out of the picture, we want to build up as much as we can to that page turn. So we reorder the dialogue in these two balloons, saying, teach you to leave my old lady alone. You're about to get galvanized, and now your, your brain's going, oh no, those poor cops, and then you turn the page, and it's Braxwell to the rescue, and it's like, oh, thank heavens. So that's the way that should have been written. And because we can't have a, an issue of Ripaverse without a coloring problem, we have this scene where uh, this uh, redhead, who apparently is a telepath influencer of some sort, uh, he has his hand up on the divider, which was previously colored blue, but for some reason is colored purple here. And that's confusing in that 
he's also holding up something at the same height that one would hold up a book that someone was trying to show someone, a, a message, uh, even a blank piece of paper, some kind of some kind of thing to look at. So what because the because the stall or the uh, partition here is not colored the same as it is in the previous scene, it makes it seem like it's a different thing altogether that he like pulled out of his pocket and now he's holding up. It needs to be the same color. This is almost like the exact opposite of the trucks issue that I had with ISOM number one. There, the problem was that you had two trucks that were the same color and it became confusing which was which. Here, you had the same item that was two different colors from panel to panel. And you really needed it to be the same color to make sure that we understood what the guy had his hand on. And we have a bad choice in lettering as well. I do not for the life of me understand what possessed somebody to throw italics onto all the text into in, in these particular balloons. Uh, now, I think it had might have had something to do with the fact that previously, when we were dealing with people who were speaking within a building and you didn't have any line of sight or dialogue balloon lines to them, then you put italics on that to kind of show this is dialogue. But when you have dialogue balloon lines going to the car, and we can see the characters, basically, or we can at least see to where the dialogue balloons are going. All of this text that's in the red circles, that should have been just plain straight up and down text. There should not have been italicization going on here. And this section, this last section, I have to call, damn it, Joe, because Joe Bennett has a peculiar habit. It is a peculiar habit of not being able to draw text correctly. Now, this is where the text is not, is not put on the page by the letterer. This is where the text is put on the page by the artist. And here we have the example where we have the police department. Except that's not how you abbreviate department. Department is abbreviated D-E-P-T. And not only that, but it looks like somebody actually tried to fix it and fixed it badly. So I don't know what was there before, but this is not right. And it's not even, <laughs> the P is not even level on anything else. But there's, an, there's another problem that Joe introduces, and this one is where we get into disturbing territory. You remember the title of my uh, presentation? If you've forgotten, it was Second Act, Third Reich. What am I talking about there? Well, it has to do with this scene with uh, Chief Holcomb, who is uh, Brian Solari's superior. Now, I know his name is Chief Holcomb because on the next page we do see his name on the uh, title plate on his desk. However, if you look at his, his uh, name plate on his shirt in this scene, it's Holkenib. Holkenib? How, how did you go from Holcomb to Holkenib? And then I thought, wait a minute. That B at the end of Holkadeb looks kind of weird. It doesn't have a straight back. It has more of a curve at the bottom. It may even have a curve at the top. It looks like an 8. And that would mean the first and last characters of Holkadeb are actually H and 8. And that's when my stomach began to sink. Because if you remember anything about Joe Bennett's history... You know that he was the famous artist of Immortal Hulk, but he was booted from any further relations with Marvel Comics because he was accused of anti-Semitism by planting images in Immortal Hulk. One specific image, this particular one, in which instead of writing jewelry on the jewelry store window, he wrote Jewelry. And there's even Star of David and a Jewish name of it on the on the jewelers. So when I see that H and 8, and being unfortunately familiar with um, some of the tropes that follow anti-Semitism, one of the things that I know is that there's a lot of code talk in anti-Semitism, one of them being numbers to letters correspondence. So the numbers 1 through 8 would correspond to the letters A through H, which puts 8 as corresponding to H. So if you've got 
Holkadib, where you've actually got an H and 8 as the first and last characters, that equals H8, which if you transpose the letter in for the 8, you get HH, which equals, yep, this guy. Ugh. Do we have a second instance of Joe Bennett throwing some anti-Semitic stuff into a comic book? God, I hope not. I really do. But I'm like, how do you explain Hulkanib? I mean, come on. Where do you get that? And where do you get these, these, these round... It's... Please let this be a coincidence, okay? I mean, and the thing that blows my mind is Eric July says, why do people keep saying I have no editors? I have editors. It's because, I mean, you, yeah, and you do, and you do have editors. You have, you know, Alan Ford, Carol Brown, Andrew Rodriguez, and Eric July's editor-in-chief. But it's because you let stuff like this in. You let stuff like this into your book, and none of your editors notice it. None of your editors notice this stuff. None of your editors notice this stuff. It's like you barely have editors. Why do people keep saying I have no editors? I have editors. Really? Where? Oh, God. So, yeah, I'm calling this presentation Let's Fix Alpha Core Number One, Second Act, Third Reich, because I feel kind of obligated to point out what it is I saw there and what the possible connections could be. Now, I hope it's not the case. I hope it's another one of these just plain-ass misunderstandings where, you know, there's nothing ill in, there's nothing of ill intent involved. But somebody's got to know, and I doubt that I'm going to be the only one who noticed this. So, oh, God, you need real editors on your book. I mean, look at all of the different problems that I was able to find with the book. And then realize that your editors are not up to the task. So quit allowing amateurs to run the show and hire actual specialists. Now, I do know that some people have been hired on. I think it was, uh, oh, goodness gracious, was it uh, Kanan White who is now going to be the, uh, the art editor? So maybe we'll get some fixes on that. And then I don't remember who else got hired in. I think Eric is actually making real progress toward getting an actual editorial staff put together who may be capable of catching all the errors that I have listed in this uh, in this presentation. But my God, oh man, I mean, you just don't want the kinds of connotations that some, that, that at least that particular mistake of Joe Bennett's is going to buy you. You don't want that, all right? Ugh. So let's hope for the best and hope that that was just some weird error that managed to creep in and that there's nothing more sinister behind that. Okay, thank you all very much. I hope the audio was to your satisfaction. Please do, again, let me know in the comments uh, whether the audio is good this time. And um, please do subscribe if you haven't already so that you can catch my later comments on Alpha Core number one. I still have about 30 plus pages to read. Um, so I am looking forward to getting done with that because, oh my gosh, it's a big slog. I can't tell you how many times I had to go back and revise this particular presentation because it was either every single time I managed to find another thing and, well, you know, it's, 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 it's packed. It's free packed. It's pretty packed full of errors and uh, and one one really really horrible error in particular. So um, thank you again for watching. Please do subscribe. I will talk to you all later. I'm Mike Partika. Appreciate your time.